Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. So our first speaker is Professor Vijay Natarajan. So Vijay is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Automation and Computational and Data Sciences. Uh, he's, his scientific interests are visualization, computational geometry, computational topology, and mesh processing. Vijay did his PhD at Duke University and his bachelor's and master's at, at BITS Pilani. So Vijay is the recipient of many awards, uh, national as well as international. So he's, the, uh, he's a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, INSA okay. Young Scientist <laughs> Medal, <laughs> INA Young, Young Engineer Award, and recently a Humboldt Research Fellow for experienced researchers. So with that, I'll take Vijay, take the floor. So thanks, Arnav, for that very generous <laughs> introduction. I'm not a fellow, uh, young associate. Um, I don't know if they're knocking for me to stop or to start. <laughs> um, so, so thanks for coming. Um, uh, so there's a lot of contrast, right? So big data, small audience, but uh, hopefully people come. Um, uh, so I'm going to. Um, talk about symmetry uh, in, in scientific data, right? Uh, if it becomes quite bad, then maybe we, uh, we take a break or something. Um, so I'm going to start by, uh, by trying to go through the terms in my, uh, the, the various uh, terms in my, in my uh, title, right? Just to make sure that we are on the same page. And uh, in order to simplify that task, I have uh, shortened the title. Um, so you can read the, the full title there. I'll come to come to that. So symmetry in, in scientific data, right? So let's start by looking at what scientific data is. Um, so uh, when I say scientific data, I mean data that comes with a uh, geometric context. So so data where the domain is uh, uh, is spatial. Uh, it could be a line, could be a plane or a surface. Uh, for example, elevation uh, maps or uh, some kind of temperature distribution within this room. Um, um, so in all cases, the domain is spatial, right? So, uh, so such data could come from uh, from imaging devices. Um, so it could be um, near infrared microscopy or electron microscopy uh, or other medical imaging uh, devices. Data could come from simulations. Uh, so uh, simulations to to uh, uh, to compute and track networks um, of pores in a, in, a, in a kind of a sponge-like material. Or it could be uh, simulations that give you the density distribution in, in for example, something like silicium, right, in, in crystal. Um, in all these cases, uh, so you have the data, and the focus is uh, understanding the data, right, um, uh, because it plays an important role in the scientific method. Um, now, um, so you have the data and you want to understand it, right? So let's go on to how to understand this data. But before that, we want, I want to just say that the focus of, uh, for today's talk is data which can be represented as a scalar function, right? Or a real valued function. Now, I have scientific data and I would like to make sense out of it. So I use um, data visualization. So what is visualization? Uh, visualization is the process of uh, creating visual representations of data. Now, um, um, so this has uh, 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 been an, estab it's an established field about 25 years. Uh, there's a lot of work done on directly presenting the data to you, right? So what are some interesting challenges that um, uh, have uh, uh, kind of that are thrown up in the past what, what, five years or so, right? Uh, there are a, a few challenges. I, I don't present all of them. I just present uh, 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 three here. Uh, so the top two are not surprising. Uh, the data sizes are, 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 are rapidly increasing, right? And um, we want to be able to handle large data sizes. Uh, so large data always uh, comes with some context, right? So one gigabyte is, is very large if you, are look, if you are working with a handheld device or a mobile device. Um, it may not be too big if you're working with a, with a supercomputer, right? Uh, more importantly for me uh, uh, um, is the fact that the data is becoming feature rich, right? So uh, the simulations are run, are, are run at higher precision, right, with high fidelity. So you have a lot more features that are captured, right? Um, and you want to be able to um, 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 understand all these features in your data. So as an example, here is a visualization on the right, a classical visualization of 
combustion, right? So there's a lot of turbulence in combustion, in the combustion process. A classical visualization will display the, uh, the density of fuel or the density of oxygen as it's consumed, and map it to color and show it as a volume, right? Now, as the structure becomes highly turbulent, you, you can't make sense out of this, this entire data. So you want to be able to uh, look at interesting features in the data, which you cannot necessarily see from far away. So there is this spaghetti-like structure on the left, where, which essentially captures these basins of ignition, right, or basins of extinction of the flame, and how these are connected to each other, right. So if these are computed, and you look at the interrelationship between this, these basins, then you get a better idea of how the combustion progresses in your engine. Uh, so that's an interesting take. So um, um, as a visualization researcher, this is a challenge for me. And if I don't have challenges, I'm out of job, right? So, so I, I think that is the, the line of thinking when I say this is a challenge for a visualization researcher, right? Um, right. So, um, so, so there is the third um, aspect, which is uh, all the more interesting. Uh, uh, it's also a challenge. Uh, but related to the to the to the above two challenges, which is um, I no longer want to present the data as it is, right? But I would like to present um, uh, the data together with with some analysis performed, right? And I already tried to motivate the need for such an integrated uh, analysis and visualization. Now, in order to do this, uh, th I mean there are many approaches to integrate analysis with visualization. Um, one uh, uh, approach is to uh, present visual abstractions of the data. So let me give, uh, let me uh, show this by, by example. So here on the middle is uh, a, a visualization of what's called the visible human data. So this is a, a scan of the human body. So it's just the torso. Um, and this is visualized using a technique called volume rendering where you map uh, the density values to some color and transparency. So you see through the volume. Uh, so clearly, this does not highlight all the parts that you may be interested in, right, or selectively. Um, so what you see on the left is a visual abstraction of this uh, data, right? So it's, it's abstract. It's a summarized representation. So it may not make sense as is, right? What this captures is, is uh, interesting subregions or interesting subdomains of this volume. And uh, so once... Uh, but the person who's running the visualization tool is, a, is, is able to interact with this uh, visual abstraction, they would be able to select, for example, arcs in this, um, um, in this tree in order to highlight uh, regions such as the, the, uh, the abdominal, the, the colon structure, or the lung structure, or the bone structure. Right? So, so the visual abstraction allows for one to explore the volume in an intuitive manner, because there is a, 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 a learning curve. But uh, this, so the, our idea is to reduce the learning curve by making the, abst making the abstraction as intuitive as possible, right? So coming to the, uh, to the next term, which is symmetry, right? So we see symmetry ev uh, everywhere, right? So we see it in natural uh, uh, objects uh, or, or man-made uh, objects, both in terms of the geometry of these objects and in terms of the, the, the material distribution. Uh, we also see symmetry in this building, uh, even in the logo of IIC. Um, uh, so now I made this slide, I realized that the text makes, breaks the symmetry, so maybe we don't want the text. So we see symmetry everywhere, um, which is reason enough to, to study symmetry, right? Um, but let's um, uh, try to motivate that a little bit more, right? So, so here is the, the full title of my talk. So I would like to study symmetry in scientific data with the aim of improving the, uh, uh, the way that I would like to visualize scientific data, right? So why would I study symmetry? Here are some examples uh, of symmetry in, uh, in various data sets, right? So symmetry occurs, in, so, so various organisms exhibit symmetry, right? Uh, in very complicated ways. So this is dodecahedral symmetry in uh, the human adenovirus. 
uh, various protein complexes also exhibit symmetry. Uh, so this is uh, rotational symmetry um, in a protein complex. Uh, in fact, this symmetry is used to solve the structure in the first place. Right? Um, symmetry is also uh, exhibited in various uh, simulations that uh, from engineering uh, domains. So for example, here are some translational reflection symmetries in, in vortex flow uh, simulations. So in all these cases, I am interested in um, uh, studying the symmetry, extracting it, and then using it for visualizing my data. Right? So what do I mean by um, uh, symmetry in uh, scientific data like this, in particular symmetry in a scalar field? So let's get down to some definition. Right? Uh, so informally, uh, when I say symmetry, I mean repeating patterns within the scalar field. Right? Um, but formally, um, if I'm given a scalar function f defined over a domain m, um, I would call two subdomains m sub 1 and m sub 2 as symmetric um, if there is some transformation that takes m sub 1 to m sub 2. In addition, I would like this transformation to preserve my scalar values also. So uh, uh, in addition, I would like the transformation to preserve my material distribution. So, uh, here, so here is an example of um, uh, uh, temperature that's uh, distribution in a, in a conductor. So I would call the left and the right legs as symmetric copies of each other uh, uh, because they are uh, uh, repeating units mo not just in terms of the geometry but even in terms of the material distribution, right, or the temperature distribution. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you had, you just jumped ahead. So the problem is that I would like to find all symmetric regions m sub i and uh, uh, of course the challenge here is that uh, t is unknown right so I would like to look through all the space of all transformations right um, further my uh, uh, repeating units could be uh, could be anywhere could be sitting anywhere at any scale right so that makes the problem uh, uh, difficult and interesting uh, as we will see, we will, uh, uh, for, for practical uh, uh, data sets, we, we, will, we will restrict T to some uh, class. Yes. Here, here we are looking for continuous transformations or are you allowing for discrete transformations? For instance, in the last spectrum, it's a discrete, discrete transformation. Classes, classes, which again, classes, classes, which is discrete. And the way you handle discrete transformations is the Right, so uh, uh, what you will see here is that I'm, uh, I'm assuming that my data is represented as a, uh, as a real valued function which I assume is, is continuous, right? Um, so, uh, so there are uh, possible extensions of uh, what I'm describing to uh, the, the purely discrete setting, right? Uh, so even here in, in these cases when I talk about scientific data as represented as scalar fields, the data is often available as a, as a uh, as a sample, right? Um, so I do have to uh, uh, employ some interpolation to get a continuous function. Right? Okay. Uh, so more specifically, what I'm going to do today is um, uh, talk about symmetry extraction when there is a lot of noise, right? Um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about two methods. Both methods are going to um, uh, depend on um, a topological analysis of the scalar field. Uh, yes. So I would like to, so there are many applications. Uh, uh, towards the end of the talk, I will talk about a few sample applications, right? But then there is no limit to the kind of applications. Um, so. A f so I would like to first of all exhibit uh, or explicitly highlight the symmetry that's present in the data, right? Um, um, particular, in particular, the, so for example, the human adenovirus, right? So it's clear that th that structure is important, right? Uh, uh, the structure of the virus is important and it exhibits symmetry. So I would like to extract that symmetry explicitly. Um, once I am able to extract it, I can of course highlight it in terms of visualization, but I can also do further analysis once I have the explicit repeating copies. Right? So I will come, to, come down to that to, towards the end of the talk. Right? Okay. 
So, uh, so I, I'm going to briefly talk about two techniques, right? Which is uh, uh, both uses this notion of contours um, in order to extract uh, 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 symmetry in in my scalar field. Um, so, so what what do I mean by topology? What do I mean by connectivity analysis or topological analysis? Right. So, I will I will start with that. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll also talk about some applications. Right. So. Um, So I'm given a, a, a scalar field, right? A scalar function defined over a domain. Let me first define what a contour tree is, right? In order to do that, I'm going to use a very simple function, right, um, uh, to illustrate uh, what's hap going to happen to this, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the domain as I sweep it in increasing order of function value. So I'll play this video again. So maybe you can just look at it once. So here, um, my scalar function, or the domain, is is this uh, is this two torus, right? Um, and the scalar function is the height from the surface, right? So what you see in the video is a sweep through the domain in increasing order of function values, and what you're seeing is essentially level sets, right? Uh, the pre-image of a given scalar value. What we would like to capture is the uh, evolution of the connectivity of these level sets, right? And that is essentially captured in this graph, right? Um, so this graph in general is called a, the Reeb graph, and in specific situations it happens to be a tree, and in that case we call it a contour tree. So why contour? Um, so as you will notice, each uh, level set component is mapped to a point on this uh, graph. And each connected component of this level set is called a contour. Right? So we are going to work with contours and contour trees from now on. Yes. The, level set, you just mean the, the pre-image of a scalar value. So you take a so constant height surface. Right? So the Reeb graph is unique. The Reeb graph is unique. Yes. Given, Given the scalar function. Given the scalar function. Okay, so more for, um, 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 so I, I, I should say that I don't know what you mean by algebraic genus, but the topological genus is what we capture. Yes. So algebraic genus. So if you look at the, uh, so uh, a torus is nothing but like a, you can write it as a kind of thing. Okay. So if you take my kind of thing, given this circuit, that would be like a torus. Right. So yeah, if you if you are trying to yeah model it that way, so yeah, so I I would say that th so this Reeb graph does capture in to some extent the genus, right? But uh, um, so in general, it, it may not even capture the genus explicitly, right? Um, so this is true only for these closed bounded uh, 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 manifolds, right? Especially two manifolds. In other cases, you may not even capture the genus. Right? What you capture is connected components. So so genus is uh, uh, right. So it's, it's something more than that, right? Uh, so if, if you want to describe it in terms of homology, then you're talking about just the zero homology. Uh, right, so I think we are we are going off tangent by talking about that, right? Because here we are given the function, and my aim is to understand the function and not the space, right? The space is typically simple, right? It's simply connected, and uh, there's nothing much to learn about the space. Uh, what's interesting is the function defined on the space and the and the regions defined due to the function. So let's look at a contour tree for the same uh, kind of a height function. Again, uh, for illustration purposes, this is a very simple uh, height function. And you again notice that the contour tree captures the, uh, uh, the connectivity changes in the 
uh, um, in the level set. Now, if you want to look at it, um, um, so I already talked about this. If you want to state this formally, right? So, what we have in uh, the contour tree is essentially just the quotient space, which is defined by uh, gluing together point, points that belong to the same connected component. Right? Um, what what we would do is we would so this contour tree is going to be crucial for our analysis, but we would present the contour tree in a slightly different way, right? Um, so, I would present the contour tree. Uh, 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 more similar to a biological tree, so with, with a trunk and, uh, and branches, right? Uh, so, we want to think of this uh, going from the contour tree to this so-called branch decomposition as a way of representing uh, these, uh, these features in a, in a hierarchical manner, right? So, this feature uh, uh, has a child feature, right, which is captured in my branch decomposition. And given the contour tree, you can compute this branch decomposition uh, using a very simple uh, linear algorithm. It's not too difficult. So once we have the contour tree, uh, I would like to analyze this contour tree to capture uh, symmetry in my data. Right. So um, so this is a uh, uh, this is a line of attack that we have used uh, uh, to extract uh, uh, symmetry, and there are multiple algorithms that we have developed in the past. Um, uh, so, so I've already talked about the visible human and how the contour tree can be used to highlight uh, um, interesting uh, uh, structures in, in my volume. But there are other topological structures also that can be uh, defined, uh, such as what's called the Morse mail complex that I'm going, not going to talk about today, uh, which will also help you uh, uh, um, uh, represent your, your, your scalar field in an abstract form. Right? Uh, so let's go on to the first algorithm. Um, uh, which is essentially based on uh, matching subtrees in my contour tree, right? So we've already seen that the contour tree track tracks these evolution of the um, isocontour topology, right? But uh, we we just looked at height functions, so uh, just to make sure that we are not working with height functions only, right? We work with generic functions. So here is a simple uh, function, but not the height function with the uh, three minima, so uh, the function um, uh, is mapped to grayscales, so darker colors correspond to lower values and lighter shades correspond to higher values. Um, and so the blue minima, there are three minima and there are uh, uh, a bunch of maxima on the boundary. So if you want to uh, uh, draw the contour tree for this, it would look something like this, which again three uh, leaf nodes corresponding to minima, blue leaf nodes, and uh, I think four or five. Uh, again, leaf nodes corresponding to maxima. Now, these contours merge um, at uh, exactly so-called saddle points or saddle criticalities right, um, of the function, um, which it, so which is actually used to actually construct the contour tree. Right. So the fact that the nodes of the contour tree correspond to critical points <coughs> is used to design efficient algorithms to compute the contour tree in the first place. Right. So I have the contour tree. Um, so the the key observation is yes. Uh, so in the function, the function was uh, something that I tried to illustrate using the color map. So low values correspond uh, are mapped to to darker colors, and the lighter shades correspond to higher function values. Right. So this was essentially a sum of Gaussian. Um, so. So the first algorithm is based on the observation that um, similar regions um, in my domain uh, would map to uh, similar subtrees of the contour tree, right? Uh, so I, I, I turn this around and try to identify um, similar subtrees in my contour tree, right? And in order to do that, um, uh, I need a measure of similarity between subtrees, um, which uh, looks at the, uh, the function distribution and uh, possibly the geometry. Um, and I also need a way to enumerate various um, interesting subtrees. I may not be interested in all possible subtrees, right? As, uh, as we already saw, there is this hierarchy of features. So I'm not interested in all subtrees. I'm only interested in, a, uh, in, in, in select subtrees. So I need a way to enumerate these subtrees. Um, so with these ingredients, we, uh, we actually designed an algorithm to, um, uh, to find uh, uh, similar subtrees, 
right? And uh, what you see here is directly just the result, right? So you see similar subtrees uh, given the same color, right? So so with cyan and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, pink, uh, brown, and so on. And what you see on the left is a volume uh, visualization of um, um, of a molecule which was imaged using electron microscopy. And what is seen, what you see on the right is um, uh, is the regions corresponding to these subtrees. So, for example, all the or the purple guys are are, are mapped to this uh, these set of uh, uh, collections of atoms, right? And the pink ones, I think, are, are are smaller ones here, and then the cyan are mapped to the cyan guys here. Uh, so, essentially, once you have these similar subtrees captured, so each subtree corresponds to a subvolume, and uh, those are the subvolumes which are symmetric copies of each other. It's a very simple algorithm. It's already worked quite well, right? Uh, uh, in the sense that it was fast. Computing the contour tree is fast. Finding these subtrees is fast, and it, it it's already able to detect symmetry at multiple scales. One key, uh, 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 I wouldn't say a drawback, um, uh, a limitation in in a sense is that geometry is not considered explicitly uh, in this approach. So once I map my uh, uh, my scalar field to this contour, contour tree, I lose all geometry, right? Uh, I don't care about the uh, the explicit geometry of my contours. They are all mapped to just this one arc in my contour tree. Um, so which is the reason why you may, uh, when you look at the symmetric copies here, right? So the the shape of these two guys may not be exactly uh, equal to each other. Yes. Yes. Yes, so I didn't go over those details. So, right. So I look only at the situations where um, I have a tree, and it turns out that when your domain is um, uh, is like a sphere, right? It's like a like or a cube, right? Then the then the the Reeb graph always has uh, no cycles. Always the tree. Yes. Right. So, so, so the, uh, the the power of this approach is that you, we don't have to look at the space of all transformations, right? Uh, since we go from the data to this abstract representation, uh, so um, uh, I don't have to look at transformations explicitly. So, your question is: um, uh, Does this mapping capture? Um, all so, so the, the uh, so computing the contour tree is requires just a single, essentially a single pass, right? Maybe two passes, right, through the data. Yeah. I'm sorry. Larger scale, yes. Right. So, uh, right. So, the, the, so these were the same thoughts that 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 went through uh, our minds when we were talking about this initially, right? Um, so it turns out that uh, there's a, a large, uh, 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 several data sets where the symmetric copies are at the same scale, right? So we s try to solve this simpler problem first. And um, uh, so working across the scale um, uh, is, uh, is difficult, at least on, on the ground, it turned out to be quite difficult because of a lot of noise and uh, Yes. These are like cells or human bodies or sure. that. But if I have like, you know, a bunch of numbers, yeah. is that interesting or I'm just thinking something new? Um, so it's definitely interesting to up, to use the topological analysis, so to compute the contour tree for such data and analyze the contour tree, right? To me, it's not clear, uh, um, uh, as of now, it's not clear if there would be repeating copies. If there would be repeating copies, uh, uh, then uh, Right, so this analysis is applicable to higher dimensional data also.
Yeah. Uh -huh. Right. So, uh, uh, so what is important here is that we don't capture all possible features, right? We clearly say what we mean by features. So, features are uh, uh, represented by uh, local maxima and local minima, right? And uh, and how they uh, are related to each other. Now, if there happens to be a, a, a large flat region, which is a very important feature, right? Unfortunately, this analysis will not capture such a feature. Right? How, how, on the other hand, if within this framework, I would like to give higher weight to uh, certain maxima, right, within a certain region, right, based on my application domain. Let's say I know that my, the the left part of my data, right, uh, was. Uh, uh, was computed at higher precision as compared to the right, right, or there was a nest within which the data is available at higher precision. So I would like to preserve the data, uh, the features within that subvolume. We can always do that. Um, so, uh, so note that while we uh, remove all geometry when we go into the tree, right? So each tree still has a mapping back to the uh, to the domain. So I could use that uh, in order to do further analysis. Uh, defining the F turns out to be important if you want to study the space, but uh, for me, F is given uh, from the from the domain, right? So in this case, it's the electron microscopy data. So, uh, so uh, right, so the, the the density information from there. Yes. Yes. Uh, no, I will be able to d distinguish between the the two at a higher scale because the four petals will actually combine into one branch in my contour tree, whereas the four circles will not. Right. Yes. Right. So which is uh, so which is crucial. So so the uh, so this method does detect symmetry at multiple scales. So there is symmetry at that smaller length scale, right? But there is no symmetry at the larger length scale. Um, so, so in the interest of time, I will uh, uh, talk about the second technique, uh, but not in great detail, right? So, so, uh, so, the second technique follows uh, with this discussion of contours, but now we would like to incorporate the geometry of these contours uh, in order to uh, extract symmetry, right? Uh, so, here, uh, here the key observation uh, for the method is that symmetric regions have similar contours, so that is the starting point. So if you have two symmetric copies, um, I would like to think of these regions um, as uh, uh, being built uh, by shelling, right, with a set of contours. And um, the two regions, if they are symmetric, then they will have similar contours to begin with. Uh, now with this observation, we have two ideas, which is you start and use the contour as a building block for a spatial region. Right? So instead of using something like a, like a volumetric region, like a brick, you use the contour as a building block to represent a region. So, or in other words, MI can be considered as a union of multiple contours. Right? Uh, the second idea is to map this contour to uh, uh, a point in some high, uh, high dimensional space. Uh, so what is this space? So you essentially have a shape descriptor uh, to represent this contour. And I make the shape descriptor transformation invariant. And uh, so this is a choice I have. Um, if I'm interested in um, uh, just rotation invariance, then I look at shape descriptors that are rotation invariant. Right? Uh, I think this answers one of the earlier questions about the set of all transformations that, we have, that I'm looking at. Uh, so given these two ideas, here is a pipeline. Right? Um, so I start with my input uh, data, so a volume. Uh, with a scalar field defined on top of that. I begin by generating contours. Um, so here are a set of contours, right? Um, and each contour is now mapped to a point in high dimensional space. Uh, and sim similar uh, symmetric regions would have similar contours. So I would expect these contours to cluster together, right? 
uh, and I done any uh, clustering algorithm to um, extract the symmetric regions. So here I have a pink cluster which corresponds to three uh, uh, three regions here, right, which are copies of each other. There's a blue guy here, and then there's a yellow guy here. So, so here I have incorporated the geometry of these contours by uh, uh, by representing them in this high-dimensional space, right? So crucial to this up to this uh, to this to the success of this method is how we generate the contours, right? Once we generate the contours, the, there's uh, uh, existing work to, uh, 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 to, to 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 define descriptors, shape descriptors, right? Depending on what kind of invariance I would like, and clustering, of course, is a lot of work on clustering. Right? So I just borrow from those ideas. What is crucial is to be able to generate these contours. And generating the contours, again, um, we have the necessary tools in place. We have the contour tree, um, which not only captures the uh, 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 the evolution of the level sets, right, but it also uh, uh, allows me to sample the space in order to uh, cap intelligently, so that I can select distinct contours, right. Uh, so I again use the contour tree to generate a um, um, few contours which are distinct from each other um, and also contours that are not small, contours that are uh, uh, not uh, sensitive to small perturbations. Right? Uh, so again the contour tree comes uh, um, to, to save the day. Right? So this essentially means, this way of con uh, selecting these contours essentially means that my, uh, my clustering result is, is robust to noise. Right? Uh, so I put up the function a little bit, uh, uh, my clustering does not change. Right? Um, it also means that it's, uh, it's able to capture uh, symmetry uh, 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 while not being bothered about noise in the data, in the noise in the sense small features. Right? So here is a volume rendering of another molecule, uh, again an electron microscopy data. Um, so so this, vo this volume visualization again is generated by mapping the scalar value to color and to transparency, so you can see through, right? Um, the uh, uh, the gray shades uh, essentially correspond to noise in the data, right? So these are um, uh, some things. These are uh, um, kind of features that you want to ignore while capturing this true symmetry, right? That our human uh, kind of visual system is able to do quickly, right? Um, but of course, this generating this volume visualization is, is quite a task, right? You would first have to assign an appropriate color map that highlights this region and uh, gives a different color to these guys, right? Uh, and that's an art in itself, right? Uh, on the other hand, what we would do is to detect the symmetry directly by uh, uh, apply, applying this pipeline, right? Um, and we essentially get these four repeating copies, so this rotation symmetry, uh, but that's not it. So you can detect symmetry at the lower length scales also, right? So each of these, uh, uh, so this is essentially a protein complex. So there are four subunits, and those uh, subunits essentially consist of residues, right? Um, which may consist uh, consists of atoms and so on, right? So we are able to detect symmetry at each length scale. Right? Um, so each of them appear as a different cluster. Um, so here are more examples to show that we can detect symmetry at different length scales. So here again the adenovirus. Uh, so there is uh, the dodecahedral symmetry here. Uh, so there are these long, uh, um, um, I don't know what to call them, uh, uh, poles sticking out from the virus, right? Which are uh, again copies of each other. Um, and here is another protein molecule where we are able to detect these uh, subunits and again individual uh, pairs of atoms and so on. Right? Uh, so just to give you a flavor of um, um, of the difficulty, right? Uh, yes. 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 So um, uh, um, so I, yeah, I didn't go into the details of uh, of the algorithm much. Um, so we al we allow for uh, one parameter. Right, which is an approximation parameter. So, if you set the approximation parameter to zero, you are um, you are, you are interested only in exact symmetry, so exact copies. As you increase epsilon, 
you are interested in uh, approximate symmetries. Okay. Uh, so it's interesting to actually uh, use that as a slider to to analyze the kind of uh, symmetric structures you do have. Um, so, um, so here um, uh, we actually end up using a very simple clustering method, just na na neighbor-based clustering, right? Um, so, like I said, uh, the, the clustering is just off the off-the-shelf uh, uh, clustering, right? So, the hierarchy or, or, the, or what I get at different scales comes from the from the fact that I'm I am actually um, um, sampling these contours, right, uh, across the board. Uh, so I'm actually create, generating these contours at all length scales, and that allows me to uh, uh, identify symmetry at different scales. So the clustering is is always the same. Um, so this is just to uh, kind of illustrate the difficulty uh, 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 that that could arise. So so here is a CT scan of of the knee joint, right? So it's uh, so if you, um, so and of course you would, you would like these symmetric copies to be extracted. Um, but if you, if you really look at the, uh, uh, the CT scan and the local maxima uh, in the CT scan, right? So the way the bone density is, uh, so you would find a lot of uh, 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 concentration of local maxima in the corners, right? Um, and if you have any method that focuses on the importance of the maxima, right? Uh, uh, then you are doomed because uh, you'll be stuck here and you will not get any of these regions. Right? So the trick is actually to sample the entire set of contours, and uh, in order to be able to detect symmetry um, without being affected by uh, uh, these regions. Right? Um, okay. So so with that, I would uh, uh, and conclude with some applications. So the first is uh, something that I've, I've shown pictures of already, right? Um, uh, while creating a visualization, um, right, I would like to highlight uh, any interesting features that are uh, present in the data, right? I would, or I would like to pr uh, provide the user with the capability to highlight these interesting features, right? Um, so here are the volume renderings of various uh, mo molecules or uh, this virus, right? And uh, what you see in the bottom row are uh, uh, visualizations that highlight the symmetric structures, right? Um, so here is dodecahedral uh, symmetry in the adenovirus. So you, you would also notice that we, would, we are able to extract different kinds of symmetry. Here is rotational symmetry, and here uh, you have uh, this uh, so-called corkscrew symmetry, um, uh, or, or, or translational, and again, rotational and partial symmetry, right? Um, all detected using the same method. Uh, so the shape descriptor that we used uh, uh, was the uh, uh, was the spectrum of the uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator, so which was isometry invariant. So we are able to capture all these guys. Um, so just a close up of of the dodecahedral symmetry that is captured from the adenovirus. A uh, few more uh, visualizations uh, from uh, again from engineering uh, simulation simulations in engineering, right? So again, you would ha you often have these symmetric uh, or repeating units, right? Uh, which may not uh, 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 have n a nice structural meaning uh, as you had in the earlier examples. Right? But uh, something to note is that of so th visualizing these symmetric copies um, could help you identify any uh, errors or bugs in your simulation, right? Uh, for example, if I remember right, so there was maybe not this in this case. Uh, there was a periodic boundary condition that was missed, right, and um, which could be detected once you visualize the uh, uh, these repeating copies. Okay. Uh, so once you have uh, explicitly identified these repeating units, right, uh, you could do further analysis on the data, right, further visual analysis um, via a process called. Um, um, uh, uh, Linking, right? So the, the selection and the editing, right? So, so here is an example to illustrate what I mean. So, here are four repeating copies, right? Um, often, I would like to ca calculate uh, uh, either properties of this uh, one copy, right? Let's say the volume or something like that. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, um, or I would like to apply various operators, right? So smoothing operators, pre-processing operators, right? Um, in order to uh, improve the quality of my data. Now, um, since I have explicitly the repeating copies, right? I can ensure that the same operator is applied on all repeating copies, right? Uh, so here, the operator that we applied is, is a so-called peeling operator, right? That allows you to look at the interiors of this volume. And, um, and this is applied only on one of the copies and is, is linked to the other copies, um, thereby making your uh, user interaction um, very intuitive and, uh, uh, and, and, and <coughs> easy. Um, there's nothing stopping us from uh, working with just static data, right? Uh, we could explore uh, symmetric copies in time-varying data, right, by thinking of the space-time as uh, as one single uh, uh, four-dimensional data. Uh, so if you do this, then you can essentially find repeating copies, right? And essentially what you have essentially is a track of uh, uh, this region over time, right? So in this particular case, we have a region that corresponds to the uh, region around the eye of a, uh, of a, of a cyclone. So in this case, it's a hurricane, right? Um, um, hurricane Isabel. Um, but um, so the symmetric copies corresponds to tracking the uh, the region around this uh, around this eye. So you could do that not just for a single cyclone. There is this uh, very unique situation in the Pacific Ocean where you have two typhoons that appear, and you can again track um, uh, both uh, across time. Um, so in more recent work, we tried to uh, really take this work for, forward and, and uh, created a way by which uh, uh, electron microscopy data uh, uh, users right, could actually look at the, the symmetry in their data. Right? So there is, an, uh, there is this so-called EMDB, the electron mi mi microscopy database. Right? Um, and we have a, a, a symmetry viewer, which allows you to look at symmetry in any data that's available in that database. Uh, so, so our idea is to just let let this loose on uh, on, uh, on these folks, and then if there are new applications, then so be it. So, with that, I'll I'll, I'll end. I of course want to. Uh, so, all the work that I presented today is is the PhD work of Philip, who's sitting here in the last row. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's now a visualization consultant. So in case some of you want to use his services, uh, he's right here. Um, so there's some related work on symmetry also uh, done by Tala, who's also a PhD student, and Nagarjun, who's a project assistant. Um, so with that, I would uh, just summarize by saying that uh, uh, some of the, the challenges in visualization, right, I hope to address by looking at this approach of feature-directed visualization, where I want to uh, uh, create abstract representations and then use that to um, kind of uh, uh, explore my data. Right? And symmetry is uh, just one step here. Um, so um, our current focus is on bio and climate science applications. So if you're more interested, there is, uh, we often try to release code and all that. Look at that. And with that, I'll stop. Thanks. Yes. Prediction is quite difficult. Um, so uh, the best that we are able to do right now is, is analysis and tracking of uh, prior events. Right? Um, um, yeah. So I, I think I will leave it at that. Prediction is, is a whole different ball game altogether. Do about vector valued functions like uh, low and three dimensional? Yes. Um, yes. So uh, uh, as of now, we have uh, we have uh, not spent a lot of effort on looking at vector-valued uh, functions. So the vortex flow data that you saw um, was actually uh, uh, data where the vector-valued uh, uh, whatever the, the flow field uh, was processed to give me vorticity uh, information, right? Or in that particular case, it was temperature, I think. So uh, we st as of now work with uh, scalar fields. Some of these techniques apply to vector fields also. So maybe uh, uh, to follow up on the earlier question about predicting, right? We are in the business of visualizing data, understanding data. So um, visualization plays a role 
when it's it's not clear uh, uh, what kind of patterns you are looking for, right? When you want to explore your data in order to understand the patterns. Right? Once you understand what you're looking for, you make your hypothesis. I think machine learning folks uh, do a much better job. So. Right. So, um, um, so I don't have a success story in that sense where a domain expert had clearly said that it's not, uh, 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 it's not there or something like that, right? But if you look at, for example, the adenovirus, right? To create that volume rendering, right, uh, uh, it takes a lot of effort, right, to even find. Uh, let me go back to here, right? To even create this volume rendering, right? Where you uh, so if I just show the raw data with a random color map, you won't see the symmetry, right? So th so there's a lot of uh, expert work that has gone into uh, uh, to generate this image. Right? Uh, so what what we are able to do is uh, to generate such such an image al almost automatically right? with with a single parameter. So that is the uh, the big step forward. <coughs> Thank you.